Welcome to this week's interview with Kelly Levesque, an intellectually curious woman, mother, and holistic nutritionist. I'm Dr. Ben Lynch, and this is the Dirty Jeans Podcast. High blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, miscarriage, morning sickness, and a statement that puts it all together. The minute you know the science and the education, then you are self-motivated. So in today's podcast on the Dirty Jeans podcast, I was discussing with Kelly Levesque all about her these experiences that she has learned from and empowered her own life to make some changes based upon the science that she's gathered from her history of being a genetics researcher for eight years, pulled herself out of that field and put herself into a different one that focuses on actual health optimization. And she's put it to use in her own life because she experienced miscarriage and she made some different choices. And those choices led to currently two beautiful children in her own family. So with that said, enjoy the discussion between Kelly and I on this episode. So Kelly, you and I discovered each other through Instagram and uh, I, you, have, you shared a quote with me, which I wanna share with folks right now. And you stated, the minute you know the science and the education, then you are self-motivated. I think that kind of sums up from not knowing you very well, but reading a bit about you, looking at your Instagram, looking at your website, you know, looking at what you're, you're trying to do um, and are doing. I think this quote pretty much stands for kind of the direction of where we're going right now. Absolutely. Yeah. I would say, you know, my whole goal as a holistic nutritionist and someone who shares online is just to make the science of eating to balance blood sugar really easy for anyone who doesn't care about the science so that they can have a little motivation to go do it themselves. Not many people say that, <laughs> you know, you know <laughs> not many people say that, you know, science and education, uh, improves your self-motivation. And, and, uh, I think that's a, it's a unique quote and it's, it's one that needs to be brought to the forefront, especially in this day and age where, you know, enabling is so rampant. And uh, so what happened with you to, to create those, that, that statement? Yeah. Well, um, well, I think for me personally, first and foremost, health in high school is my favorite class and it was my science elective. And then when I went to USC, nature of human health and disease was my favorite class. And I learned a lot about, you know, my thesis was in um, blood, blood sugar imbalance. And it became such a motivating factor for me to take care of myself in a different way. I think growing up as a young woman, you know, you have the magazines and women's health and um, cosmopolitan, and you see these beautiful people from the outside on the covers of these magazines mm -hmm. and vanity is one thing, but when it comes to vitality and energy and feeling our best and proper digestion, like I remember having sinus infections my whole childhood in college, having to deal with major constipation um, and not nearly knowing the cause of that to then learn that, you know, I, I, I deal with dairy and gluten intolerance and um, feel my best and feel really like whip smart when I'm balanced and my blood sugar is balanced and I'm fat adapted and just really, I think science is, is sexy. I think it's a really fun way to take care of yourself when you understand how your body works and you're, you're fueling vitality and energy. And, um, instead of thinking about vanity, it's, it's a way deeper why. And then, you know, fast forward, starting my business, helping others, getting pregnant, thinking about my children, thinking about my family. Like I want the people who follow me, the people who work with me, my family, my friends, my parents, I want them to care about their health, not because of the way they look from the outside, but, but the way they feel on the inside. Um, and I think even knowing like, adding leafy greens and veggies to your plate are going to support your microbiome and, you know, making sure that you're eating enough, um, healthy proteins can support your, you know, mineral levels, your B, your B vitamin levels. Like I just, 
I geek out on that stuff and, and that's way more motivating for me. How do we shift the mindset of focusing on the external us and, and start focusing on that there is tremendous beauty on the inside. And if you have the beauty on the inside, then the outside will follow. And not only that, but you'll feel phenomenal. So what do you say to people who, who don't really make any changes unless the pain is great enough for them to do so? A lot of people that I'm working with will come to me with goals and pain points. But I will say when it comes to beauty on the inside, it's showing up on the outside. Like yes. I can see it on my, in my client's skin. For example, I know um, when there's redness and dull skin um, and you just don't see the vibrancy. And so that's one of the things I actually get asked all the time is, you know, how can I work on having a little bit more of a glow, glowing skin? And, and my whole thing, it always starts with it always starts with the diet and the gut microbiome and teaching people to balance their blood sugar. Maybe their end goal is that they just want clearer, more dewy, glowy skin, but we're working backwards. And I'm teaching them the science of gut health and blood sugar balance for that increase in energy for that glowing skin. And, and that's, I think the beauty of beauty of nutrition and taking care of ourselves is that it does show up on the outside, but it just isn't going to happen as fast as, some cosmetic or injection or Band-Aid. Great point too, is because once someone starts making that connection of, of supporting their gut microbiome, whatever thing that they are struggling with, and they do see the reflection on their skin, um, and that is a motivating factor, right? To, to go to the next level. And then you said something else. You said, I want people to care about your health. How do you do that? For me, when I look at, um, lifestyle diseases that are rampant in our society that to me are preventable, reversible. And I've used my dad as an example recently because it hit so close to home. You know, my dad called me and said, my doctor wants me to go on a statin Kelly. Um, and I have some pre-diabetic numbers. And as someone who is obsessed with blood sugar balance, who's written books on it and given, <laughs> given my books to my parents, it was, you know, it obviously hit home. And what was important for me was that my dad understood that that was completely reversible if he understood how to do that. And so, you know, I got him a continuous glucose monitor. He had been using a glucometer prior, but we got a continuous glucose monitor and he tested his blood sugar about a month later, maybe it was five weeks. and all of his pre-diabetic numbers were down. We saw it in the continuous glucose monitor. He was waking up with fasting blood sugar at like 130, 140, you know, and today he's waking up in the nineties. He's not in the 60s, 70s or eighties, awesome. but for my dad, that's phenomenal. And he's lost close to 20 pounds. And my dad is always, you know, he's a teddy bear. He's a dad of three girls. He's like all, you know, so supportive of us growing up and like, just the, like the most amazing, like laugh you've ever heard. And all I want for him is health. Like I want him to care about his health, but this is where science can motivate people. He all of a sudden started seeing like, oh, well, I'm making this choice at the Mexican food restaurant with my wife, my mom to, you know, have the chips and have the burrito. And then I see the number spike up because it's like processed foods, bad oils, whatever, really highly palatable. He can't really stop. It's not his fault. It's, it's that that stuff you know, lights up our brain. And so just for him to see it and say like, okay, well maybe next time I'll get the fajitas, I'll hold the tortillas. I'll have a few chips. Let's see how high it goes. And what he started to learn was like eating the fab four only, oh, it only took him, you know, years, but, um, that eating that, you know, high quality proteins or healthy fats and veggies, like really like you don't, it's not rocket science. Those foods help support blood sugar balance. They're going to bring down that fasting number over time. And and that's what we saw. Like it wasn't, it wasn't saying like what you've done in the past is bad. It was elevating all these little choices, giving him the education and the, and, and a diagnostic tool to say like, oh, wow, this is what's happening in my body. This is my individual bio individuality. And here are some choices that I can make. And I feel empowered. I feel educated. I can take hold of my own health and change it. And um, you know, not everyone can get their hands on a continuous glucose monitor, but a glucometer is something that I teach clients to use all the time. And that's, you know, that's less than $40 at Walmart or Target or Amazon, wherever you want to buy one. And it, it can easily teach you about yourself, but you can also do, you know, test foods and see what creates more energy throughout the day and, and just learn a little bit about what's coming out in PubMed research around nutrition to, to support a healthy, vibrant life. So 
I love that because my dad doesn't love science. You know, he loves business and finance and real estate. And so getting him to open his mind up to this side of taking care of himself um, was amazing. Well, what I'm hearing over and over again is you have the you have the ability to do it if you understand how. Yeah. And that first choice to implement is not an easy one because you have doubts. It takes effort. It requires change. It's a new thing for you to become, you know, to incorporate in your life. And we don't like, you know, driving, uh, creating new lanes in our brain for something because that's a lot of work. We like just the, the, the quick and easy highway of, you know, have dinner, go get those Pepperidge Farm cookies, because that reminds me of, of having Kelly as, as a young daughter in our home. And I, I want to cherish that moment and having a Pepperidge Farm cookie after dinner, what's the harm? Right. Well, check your blood glucose meter. Oh, that's the harm. Right. Oh, I'm overweight and you know, my blood pressure is high. That's the harm. Now I can't succeed in my business and the things I actually like. So now I care about science more so I can actually enjoy the things which I like, which is business and real estate and travel and whatever the other things that, you know, he enjoys. But you, you did it. You mentioned a very, very important point. You said, learn how food affects you. People eat food because A, it tastes good, B, they're hungry, or C, that it fills a, an emotional void, unfortunately. But the food that really nourishes you or your dad may actually really negative affect me. You, do you recommend avocados to your father? I do. Avocados are very healthy food. Yeah. And it's the, the popularity of avocado has skyrocketed. Totally. Yeah. And, um, but I love avocado. I love the fact that I could slice open an avocado and, and get some healthy fats and proteins. And it was sweet, but not too sweet. And I could just eat it almost like an apple after I peeled it. Yeah. Um, but an hour or two later, probably an hour later where, you know, I get hot, I get tired, uh, my focus was off. And then I was like, oh, what the heck? You know, I'll do a food allergy test, IgG from US Biotech, avocado, five, IgG. Wow. What? Take a mental note before you eat how you're feeling. Are you feeling hungry, a little brain fog, a little lethargic, you know, what you're craving. You eat whatever food that is, and then you check in 15 minutes, 30 minutes, like, how am I doing? That's all. It's a quick check-in. And is your pulse rate elevated? Are you hotter? Is your tongue burning? Um, and so on. So what little tricks like that are you recommending or have you found? So with clients and with myself or anyone interested in kind of understanding how food affects them, things that I look for, you've mentioned a couple of them, feeling really tired, um, headaches, uh, can come up excessive bloating. You know, that might be mm. due to a severe cause would be small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, but, um, there's some dysbiosis there. Um, feeling, uh, brain fog. Absolutely. Like it, I do, you immediately feel like you need to take a nap after that meal. That could be sugar load, carbohydrate load, but it also could be a food allergy. Um, and then it, when people have the ability to, I love a food intolerance test and, but also understanding what's at play here. So you have an intolerance to this food. Um, it may be because of leaky gut. We may need to work on pulling those things out, healing the gut and reintroducing them. It doesn't always have to be forever, but those are, those are definitely, um, definitely things that I'll work on with a client. Um, and if any time someone's having a problem with, uh, for me personally, eggs and dairy do come up, um, and gluten, but I've, I've been off gluten since my late twenties. And I think that's a really easy thing to do now in 2021, but, um, but dairy, you know, I don't eat a lot of dairy. And then when I was, when I'm pregnant, it's something that I crave and use during the first trimester when I'm nauseous, I love like a grass fed cottage cheese or a Greek yogurt. It's a really, you know, plain, a good way to get in protein and calcium. And, but it is interesting because I do notice that I have a little more mucus in my nose. Mm -hmm. And I knew, do notice that that's something to look at. Do you do, is your response, are you, are you having more mucus? Do you feeling congested after you eat? That's a major sign. Um, sore throat. You know, there are, there are little things that can come up for people. Um, like they may not even be attributing that to food. They might say like, Oh, I've had allergies my whole life, you know, and they're thinking seasonal or dust or grass or whatever that may be, but it can absolutely be related to food. And what becomes routine becomes normal. Absolutely. 
if if you eat something and you get tired, it's like, oh yeah, you know, it's normal to become tired after you eat because what becomes routine becomes normal and you need to be aware and mindful, checking in, tuning in, as I mentioned in the book, Dirty Jeans, over and over again, tune in to how you're feeling. And it just takes a moment, right, Kelly? It just takes a second. Absolutely. And, and you know, you're touching on a subject that I think is really interesting and timely right now because in, intuitive eating is a really powerful movement where no yes. foods are off limits, where it's anti-diet, anti-weight loss, really like enjoy yourself, everything in moderation. And, and I love that to a point. It's something I talked about actually on a new segment a few weeks ago is that we have to have some basic understanding of science. We need to know what our bio individuality is when it comes to allergies, when it comes to our genetics. And really we need to understand how blood sugar works. I, so many times I work with clients and they're like, I'm intuitively eating. I intuitively feel like having pancakes for breakfast. And I'm going to try to make a healthy choice. I'm going to use this like you know, more lower glycemic paleo pancakes or something like that, but they, they might still at a process level spike glucose, you know, up for 90 minutes or two hours. And then that crash starts to happen where insulin's putting away that sugar. And all of a sudden they're feeling like that doesn't feel great. My cravings are increased. My energy is depleting. Um, and not, I'm not a fat adapted human. I can't just dip into to ketones. There's a too much insulin present in my bloodstream. And I'm, and I'm feeling like, intuitively, I feel like a pe an apple or I feel like a sugary yogurt, or I feel like some crackers. Like, of course you're going to feel like that because the way that your blood sugar is going up and, and depending on the amount of insulin, your pancreas is releasing it. You could be crashing and that crash is inducing cravings. And so we're really not intuitively eating at that point. We're responding to yes. our, what's happening in our bloodstream and we're not taking an educated approach. So I'm absolutely all for, if you feel like eating certain foods, but then just take a minute and say like, you know, we went to the farm stand. I went to the, to this amazing, we, we buy our produce at this farm stand here, um, called the ecology center. And they don't use, it's amazing. I'm so lucky to have it. They don't use pesticides. They have, everything's grown on the property and you, you can go in and I don't care if Sebastian eats the berries right out of the box at the store. Cause I know it's like, it's just like dirt, you know, if anything. And, but let's say we both just kind of indulge, not indulge, but we had a lot of fruit. Well, of course people need to understand that fruit is sugar. So I may feel more hungry after that. I may need to think about like what my body needs to rebalance and support that blood sugar balance in my next meal or in the next two hours. Um, and, and then you're taking an educated approach. Like I felt like having all this fruit, I enjoyed it. It was delicious. It was seasonal. Um, but now I'm kind of crashing and I neither either need to go burn that off and take a walk around the neighborhood, or I need to have like a protein fiber and fat-based snack of like a handful of nuts. Or if, if I'm rolling into dinner, how can I have some healthy protein? And if you're, if you are a, a healthy person and you eat, you know, organic strawberries, hopefully because they're loaded in organophosphates, um, if you're eating these things, you should not crash. Absolutely, because they're wrapped in fiber. Yeah, they're wrapped in fiber and your body has mechanisms at play. If your genes are functioning properly, then if you eat strawberries or even a donut, um, you're, you should have metabolic flexibility. And Kelly, you keep saying over and over again, the term fat adapted. And I want you to make sure that you know, who's listening understands that. You can choose any weight loss diet you want. You can be strict about the food that goes in your mouth. You can be strict about exercising and all that. But if you are not quote unquote fat adapted, you, you try intermittent fasting, ketogenic diet. If you are not fat adapted, you ain't losing weight. You're, yeah. you're, 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 you're struggling. So in your words, what is fat adapted? Fat adapted means that your body has the ability to, to burn fat as fuel. And so in every single cell, we have mitochondria and we can either burn sugar or we can burn ketones. And that is a fat substrate. And what is so amazing about being fat adapted, it means that you're burning off your sugar, your insulin levels become drop low enough to where then all of a sudden when you run out of sugar, your body switches over. I like to tell my clients, it's like they're a Prius and they have gas in the tank and they have mm. battery and gas is glucose and battery is fat. And you can use both forms of fuel, but the key is when your gas tank runs out, can you switch over to battery? And the thing is, is I notice when people do keto, they intermittent fast, and you mentioned these, the side effects of not being fat adapted is 
feeling keto flu, having a major headache, uh, brain fog. And it, it feels really, really hard because what's happening is your little Prius can't kick over to battery operation. Yeah. And glucose, you have an ability to store glucose as long chains of glucose. They all hook together in a compound glycogen and your liver can store some glycogen and then your muscles can store some glycogen. And that's kind of it. It's exactly so, right. You, you know, you cannot store, you know, a ton amount of glucose and that's why you get fat. You get fat because fat is a great storage compound for a lot of energy, a lot of fuel. But if you cannot access that fuel, if you're not fat adapted because you cannot switch from gas to the electric in the Prius, you're going to get overweight. When you eat strawberries or something and you, you kind of get on a high and then you crash or you eat a peach or you eat a, one cookie and you're, you're kind of on this up and down all day long, you are not fat adapted most likely. And that's a big, big issue. I think one thing to leave with your listeners is that if you're constantly filling up the gas tank, meaning you're feeling low, you're gonna have a carbohydrate process-based snack to feel better. You're constantly filling up that gas tank. And why, why would your body ever say, I'm gonna dip into fat and I'm gonna start burning fat for fuel when we have this fast, quick energy of glucose yes. from processed foods and sugar, your body's never gonna do that because why? It's gonna wanna keep you alive. It's gonna wanna keep fat stores on your body. But I think what, uh, you know, when you look back at, um, you know, the generations before us, the access to food is, and what we have available to us at any given moment in our pantry, I call it pantry flybys. It's like clients are working in zoom hours. They're, you know, in the pandemic, they're, they're teaching their kids in school. And then they're doing a pantry flyby emotionally for energy, for whatever it is. But remember that if you're constantly filling your gas tank, you will never give your little Prius a break and use that battery operation. Yeah. And then I want to shift into, um, you know, your pregnancy because pregnancy is something that is extremely, um, well, it's a, it's an amazing moment for one as a parent, um, but also as a health professional to support people to have a healthy pregnancy, because if you have a healthy pregnancy, a, you feel great. B, you have an amazing, you know, healthy child and, and C you're supporting the, your next generation in your family of grandchildren. And so it's, it's a, it's a multi, uh, it's, it's, it encompasses so much. And so you share with folks about your pregnancies and what happened and what you changed. So I've had three pregnancies. My first pregnancy um, ended in miscarriage. I was actually on my first book tour for body love. So one of the books that I put out, um, I was on a, I was on my tour and, um, I took a little mini vacation with my husband. We went to Japan, <laughs> we ate a bunch of, a bunch of fish <laughs> flew many miles. And, um, unfortunately, uh, it, it was an early miscarriage, but around eight weeks we lost that pregnancy and, um, it made me take a step back. <laughs> Actually, it was, um, it, it made me realize that I wasn't invincible, that just because I was a nutritionist and took good care of myself, that I couldn't take better care of myself or I couldn't, you know, I also, I also learned that, you know, the body's an amazing thing because if, if there was a genetic abnormality here or something that wasn't right, like, um, we're just, I think we're pretty amazing human beings. Um, and it was very sad for us, but we pulled, you know, pulled ourselves up and we gave it another try. And it's gotta be heart wrenching. It's heart wrenching. I yeah. mean, you, you, you picture your child, you, you know, you're married. I'm married to the love of my life. I've been with Chris since 2007. I like felt like I knew he was my person. And the first day I met him, like it's, we have a very special relationship and all we want, you know, all we wanted to do was have kids. We changed careers and it took us a while, you know, we got married and we didn't have children until almost six years later. And my parents were like, where, when are the grandbabies coming? Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. we had some career stuff and we just, we were, we're so excited. You know, I have two boys now. I'd love to have three or four. Like I want a rowdy house of like fun human beings that I can learn from. <laughs> like, so when I think about my family growing up in a family of five and having two younger sisters and just the energy of, you know, I grew up in a, actually in a Catholic family and I went to Catholic school. So I had friends who were from families of six or eight kids, you know, and just, they learned to share and they like, aren't so self-centered. And I don't know. I just love children. Like I can't tell you. So 
it's heartbreaking. Like to this day, when we're, when we're um, Memorial Day weekend rolls around and it's like, that was going to be our first child's due date. Like I do remember it. It doesn't oh, yeah. go away. Right. Yeah. I can imagine. I'm grateful. I'm always the kind of person that looks for the positive and tries to, Brene Brown says like resilient people tell themselves a story. Yes. You know, they, they, they tell themselves a story as to why things are working out the way that they are. And I, I would say that that's something that resonated so deeply with me in my whole life. Like, why did I go to business school instead of pre-med? Like, and then have to go back to school for nutrition. Why? You know? And it's like, if I would have got out of school and been an RD right out of SC, I would have worked in a hospital. I would have followed traditional practices. I would have towed the line. And I learned a lot. I read dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of PubMed research articles. I understood how to um, look at a study and say, does it have a significant p-value? Is it community-based? Is it double-blind? Like, what are we saying here? What, and, and that has informed my entire practice now and my ability to make science accessible to the layperson or to someone who doesn't care about science. So I will say having a miscarriage is a horrible thing, but what the blessings that I've had on the back end of that, like I wouldn't trade for the world. That's exactly, you know, why you and I are talking right now. From our pain, our biggest pains come our biggest successes. And you see that when you hear about, uh, you know, certain uh, people who are just crushing it in various areas in their life, you will, if you, you know, go back in their history, they were not doing that prior. They were st- they were really struggling with whatever it was they were struggling with that pushed them to succeed because from it's such intense pain, that is a primary motivating factor to make some changes in order to, you know, obtain the things that you want. And we started this discussion, you and I, um, and with you listening that some people are not motivated to feel great. They're just motivated to feel good. But when it comes to pregnancy, there it's either 0% or 100%. Mm-hmm. What changes did you make to make sure or to minimize your risk of having yet another miscarriage? Well, first and foremost, I realized that the running and gunning the airplanes, they weren't conducive to me and my body feeling calm and relaxed. And um, we know that elevated cortisol can affect fertility. We know that oxidative stress, whether that's radiation from an airplane or in, you know, um, low quality food, Jeff, a lot fuel. Of an, Jeff fuel, not a lot of antioxidants, like, um, fast protein bars, things like that. Like that, that's not, that's not creating that vitality that we need to be really fertile. Um, we know, you know, we know that like connecting with your partner and not just like having sex to make a baby, but, cuddling up on the couch and watching a, your favorite TV show, connecting and being present in your home, moving your body, like all of those things that I was kind of piecemealing together or not getting to when I was traveling so much, it, it all sort of changed. I actually, I actually found out that I was pregnant, not by taking a pregnancy test, but because post um, miscarriage, I actually worked to get into a fat adapted state. I was using a glucometer ketometer to understand, okay, I'm burning glucose now. Okay. Now my body's producing some ketones. We know that beta hydroxybutyrate is super anti-inflammatory and, um, and really, you know, lower fasting blood glucose, a really balanced blood sugar curve. Um, all of those things can be really supportive to fertility. So I was just checking in and then I checked my ketones one day and they were way higher. I mean, it wasn't just like, Oh, moderate, small to moderate amounts of ketones that are just like healthy and anti-inflammatory. It was like, Whoa, I'm in full-blown ketosis. How did this happen? I'm still having, you know, fiber rich berries and there's some like butternut squash and like these, you know, someone would say starchy tubers still in my diet and ketones were I was showing them in the morning and I was like, wait a second, I must be, something's happening. I might be pregnant. And I took a pregnancy test and realized that I was pregnant, Mm. but it was really just going back to the roots. It was like, how was I sleeping? How was I moving? How was I eating? And then, you know, one thing, and one of the reasons why I found you um, was actually looking for functional prenatals. Like I I've known in the past from, from blood tests, like NutriVal that I'm low in B6 and I'm low in B12. Um, and so I think when you look at the market of prenatal vitamins, um, you will find that people are putting 
sometimes improper forms of vitamins, um, <laughs> like folic acid. Um, but beyond improper forms, they're at really low doses in comparison to if someone's coming from a deficient place. And I was thinking, wow, like I just had a miscarriage. I have known in the past, I'm, I'm running and gunning. I've known in the past that I've had these specific deficiencies. I really want to up my nutrient levels, prevent, definitely be out of the deficiency zone, but really be in a place for optimal, um, being an optimal functional level, um, when it comes to these nutrients for my baby. Um, so that's how I found seeking health, which is how I found you was taking your prenatal. And of course, like working with clients. Now I have a, you have a, I have a pregnancy nutrition course online and I recommend seeking health prenatals. And one of the time, you know, sometimes I get back from clients, like they, they don't want to take eight pills, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I get it. But well, let me tell you coming from a place of feeling like you are, you don't have any deficiencies and you know that you have all the proper nutrients for your baby, knowing that things, um, like choline and your, um, you know, your, your folate levels, like those are all so critical to neural tube closure, to IQ, cognitive development. Like that is my insurance. And, and so that was also something that I brought in um, and something that I recommend to my clients. I'm so thankful that you started seeking health because you look out on the market and like I said, improper forms and low values where it's like, yeah. that's not going to get someone out of the deficiency state and that's not going to be supportive to fetal development. So what can we do to think optimally from a functional perspective. Yeah, well, I'm glad you did your research on that. And I'm, I'm glad that you realized that you were in a, such a deficient state that you really needed to optimize your nutrient levels. And I'm glad that Seeking Health Prenatals were able to support you in your pregnancy. And, and did the prenatals help you? I feel a drastic difference when I'm not deficient in B12 and B6. And um, what was so interesting is that I was taking your prenatals, um, about three months prior to getting pregnant with Sebastian, you know, we had had the miscarriage and, um, and then I got back on, you know, got on your prenatals after that. And I, I mean, I, I, this is just how I felt personally. I had zero nausea in my first trimester and so much nausea, nausea research is being linked to a deficiency in B6. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious because the second time around, um, I was taking my prenatals. I was nursing Sebastian. I, um, I nursed him until he's 18 months old. And I actually, <laughs> I had gotten a little bit bad about taking my pre prenatals there at the end, you know, not as often, not every day. Um, and I could have easily, you know, I'm breastfeeding, I'm giving all my nutrients away. And I don't want to say postnatal depletion, but, um, but I was back to writing my second book. I was going back out on my second book tour and, I, I, I weaned Sebastian at, at his 18 month birthday. And the next morning I woke up, I took a pregnancy test and I was pregnant. Wow. And, um, and I felt so nauseous my first, first trimester. And there, you know, obviously people have theories as to why some, you might feel nauseous or not feel nauseous, but I'll tell you, I am planning to have three or four children and there is no world in which I am going to let Chris, get anywhere near me without being serious <laughs> about my prenatal. Back because, off. Because if that is yeah. if that is the straw that broke the camel's back, I'm gonna be <laughs> I'm gonna be mad at myself for that first trimester with Tashin's pregnancy. But I will tell you, like, I just think it's insurance. Like for mm. me, it's insurance to know that my nutrient levels are high. It's to know that I have everything that I need to give to my child. It doesn't replace the whole food, nutrient dense diet, but like it. I mean, I think it's made a world of difference for me personally, and it's life-changing and life-giving, in my opinion. Life-changing and life-giving. I love that. And it's multi-generational. Absolutely. You know, it's, and it, a prenatal is for you. It's for your developing baby. It's for your developing placenta. And it's for your developing grandchildren. It's an essential component of your pregnancy and your breastfeeding and your, and your you know, pre-pregnancy planning as well, you know, to get you, you know, optimized to have a healthy child and healthy pregnancy. Yeah. Well, I yeah. think we all can learn from our choices and we can learn from our experiences. I mean, that's the best way to learn, in my opinion. Like, I love when Sebastian learns that he can't climb the highest tree because he fell and he, he, it, he, makes edits to his behavior or learns from something like that, then me to tell him like, don't do this or don't do that. Or you have to do this. or You have to do that. Like it's, it's how I learn personally. And, yes. and you just like saw that throughout 
the progression of, I would say like the last three or four years was me learning, learning through like, what do I need to feel my best throughout my pregnancies and, and how do I prepare myself? And, and like, again, like no blame, we're just, we're elevating. How can we elevate? How can we elevate? I, I really hope that you listening are, are looking and reflecting on your situation right now. And it just takes a moment to, you know, look at where you are, think about whatever it is that you want to, you know, do or accomplish or feel better in whatever area. Then you need to step backwards and say, what science do I need to know about this? What information do I need to acquire? Because you can, it's out there and find it. And then how do I track it? Do I just tune in and do a mental check-in or do I need to buy some devices or some tools to help me um, to, to go through that? So there's, there's a lot here. And uh, Kelly, I, I just want to thank you immensely for, for what you've shared. And I could talk with you for another four hours. Um, <laughs> but uh, Kelly, is there anything that we have not shared yet that you really want to share with, with folks? Well, I just think that there is a lot of blame that can happen for people when they don't feel their best. Um, like we're talking a lot about pregnancy and there are so many women that are facing infertility right now and people will, you know, doctors will call it unexplained fertility and infertility. And I, and I think what, what we have to do as humans is be resilient and like, you know, Brene, talk, Brene Brown talks about is, is tell ourselves a story and find purpose in what's happening in our life. Um, if someone is going through for infertility, I, I just want them to know that my heart goes out to you. You know, I obviously it's, I'm sharing my story and I do get pregnant easily, but I know so many people struggle with that. And so I would say back to the theme is like, how can you empower yourself and educate yourself? I think your genetic testing is so important. I think nutrient values or knowing your, um, your nutrient status is so important. I think understanding how your blood sugar is functioning. How are you sleeping? If you've done everything to support that and it still is, you know, not working out for you, I think have faith and trust that this is part of your story and, um, and just keep trying, keep educating. Um, so I just want it to be really positive for people that are struggling too. So you're, yeah. you're, you're like this person who is in constant, uh, optimization, which is exactly what seeking health was created for and why we, we say optimizing life because you are always doing that. So my hat's off to you for doing that, Kelly. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate your time with us. Thank you, Dr. Lynch. Take care, all. 